Good evening. I'd like to thank Alan Mulayev for allowing us to have the shiur in her house. This is the last shiur, um, almost the last shiur of 5777. And Bezat Hashem, Rosh Hashanah will be in uh, two nights from now. So we're going to talk a little bit about Rosh Hashanah. Like I said in the, uh, in the, uh, in the um, announcement for the class, we're going to talk about preparing for Rosh Hashanah, but things that you can't buy and you can't cook. Right? Hopefully everybody else working on the things you can buy and cook. That's the easy... It's not the easy part, but that's certainly in many ways the easier part. So the parasha we read last week, Atem Nitzavim, Nitzavim, right? And we see included in Nitzavim, it says, Kulechem, all of you, right? Everyone's included. And then the Torah goes on to list all of the people included, right? And if you look at the second pasuk, since this is a class for ladies, the second pasuk says, Tapechem Neshechem. Small children and your wives. Okay? So now, of course, all the ladies can ask a question. Why doesn't it say neshechem tapechem, the women and then the small children? Because who's bringing the small children? The ladies are bringing the small children. And of course, we could ask the question, well, why would we be bringing small children? To give the sachar to those who bring them. Right? So the women are said after the tapechem, why? Because they get the sachar, not just for themselves coming, but they also get the reward and the, and the, and the, and the reward for the fact that they bring their children. <clears throat> but, we understand Rosh Hashanah was the day the world was not created, the world was created over a six-day period. The sixth day of the creative process was actually Rosh Hashanah. Adam HaRishon was created on Rosh Hashanah. Of course, that means Chava was created on Rosh Hashanah. Okay? And not only were Adam and Chava created on Rosh Hashanah, but Cain and Hevel were born on Rosh Hashanah. Well, how's that possible? Because the whole concept of a prolonged time for giving birth to children and the suffering that involves in children and childbirth was as a punishment, or we could look at it a different way, Initially, we'll look at it as a punishment for Chava for eating from the tree. So what happened, the Gemara says that two people went onto the bed and four people came off the bed. Meaning what? Adam and Chava were together and then right away were born immediately. No pregnancy, no nothing. Were born Cain and Hevel. And all this happened on Rosh Hashanah. And then if we think about Bereshit, right? We know Bereshit talks about the sin of Adam HaRishon. And on Rosh Hashanah, like we spoke about in the classes I was, talked about last week, what we're trying to do, in addition to working on the sins we have as an individual, all the things that we do wrong on the, all year long, we're, trying to get, we're going to get judgment on Rosh Hashanah, and we're going to try to fix it over the next 10 days. There's also, we should keep in mind, the first sin. The first sin, which of course was the the initial, the initial insult, which of course everything afterwards flows from there. And not, you know, men have their problems and women have their problems, but if we have to think about it, the impetus for the first sin was Chava, right? Chava, Eve, what happened? The snake, of course, came to Chava. Why did the snake go to Chava, not to Adam? She was more persu- persuaded. Correct. And this is the idea when the Talmud says, and the rabbis say, that women are datem kalot. Now, if a person thinks about that, that's very insulting. Dat in Hebrew is knowledge, right? Kalot means light. That women are not too smart. Do we think that's what it means? If we think about the women of the Torah, we think about Miriam, we think about Chana and then Tanakh, we think about Buria. We think about all the great women. We think about Esther. Can we actually say that women are not smart? Some would say women maybe even are smarter than men. So Da'at doesn't just mean knowledge. Da'at has another meaning. And what it means there is that women are more easily convinced. Why are women more easily convinced? We can say two reasons, specifically one is for Adam, Harishon, and Chava, and one is in general. Adam and Chava, who heard the commandment directly? Adam. 
Chava did not hear the commandment directly. When Adam was commanded not to eat from the tree, Chava was not yet in existence. Or we can say, she was inside him. She didn't have an independent existence outside of Adam HaRishon. So she was never directly commanded by God not to eat from the tree. Which is maybe one of the reasons why the snake went to her. Because since she didn't hear it directly, it didn't have the same level of impact on her as it did on Adam HaRishon. And therefore the snake felt that was a place to go first. We know that by Har Sinai, it says that Hashem spoke to all of the children of Israel, men and women, right? All of them, the first two commandments we heard directly from God. What makes those two commandments unique? Believing in God, and thou shalt not have any idols. Because we heard them directly from God, it's imprinted on us. And that's why, despite the fact that Jews sometimes are not Shemer Shabbat, sometimes Jews are not necessarily keeping all the mitzvot, Jews will give their lives rather than convert to a different religion. Why is that? Because the Neshama heard directly from God on Har Sinai about the prohibition of idol worship and the commandment to follow God, to, to believe in God. So when we hear something directly, it has such an impact that it makes it much more difficult for us to sin. So since Hava did not hear directly from Hashem, that's why the snake went to her first. But there's another answer. Why are women more gullible? More emotional beings. Okay, okay maybe. Correct, and they're all meaning they're more innocent, right? Women are more innocent, right? Men, again, if you think about the traditional role, the man is out in the world, the woman is at home, but even without that, Chava and Adam and Chava, there was no concept of being out in the world because they didn't have any work to do per se, certainly not from a farming point of view. So, women by nature are more trusting. Whereas men are often more skeptical. And this is very important because where do the children learn emunah from? Hmm? The mother. And in fact, it says in the Sfarim that as she's nursing her children, this is how she's giving them the emunah. Okay? I don't know what kind of special thing milk has inside, whatever it might be, but there's something to be said about the woman's re- re- interrelationship with her children, and this is where the emunah is conferred. So the men are more skeptical, they're more challenging, women are much more likely to accept. And that's one of the reasons why the snake went to Chava first, because she was more susceptible. And this is what it means that datem kalot, that they're that their dot, that their their knowledge, but that's not a correct translation, as we're going to see shortly, is softer. What changed after they ate from the tree? What changed? Physically, Physically spiritually, give me both. Well, then, One or the other. Well, then they realized that they were not snakes. Okay. Okay, that's what it says in the Torah, correct? They realized that they were not, they were, before it says they were naked and they were not embarrassed, right? Mm-hmm. After they ate from the tree, what happened? They, they were, embarrassed. were embarrassed, okay? What else changed? This is a very important thing that changed. Before they ate from the tree, where was the evil? Outside. Outside. The evil was identifiable. Right? All they needed to do, and the Torah says right away, the snake was the most cunning creature on the face of the earth, correct? So imagine if you could recognize when you're being told something that is not, you know that this person is a liar. Whether you're gullible or not, if you've been burned once or twice, you're not going to listen to them a second time. Before they sinned and ate from the tree, the evil or the temptation was outside them, made it much easier to identify. Once they ate from the tree, they took that inside them. And now, when a person has a choice to do something that's right or do something that's wrong, who's talking to whom? You're talking to yourself. 
right? There's that little voice inside you that's saying, oh, there's nothing wrong with it, don't worry about it, it's fine, nobody's watching, okay? And then there's a little other voice inside, come on, you know you're not supposed to do that, it's the wrong thing. And there's this constant battle that's going on inside, right? But who's talking to whom? No one is schizophrenic here. Who's talking to whom? It's the Yetzirah, which is on the inside. That changed the situation very, very significantly and made it much more difficult because the first thing one has to do is identify the temptation, what is causing the temptation. Because sometimes we do things we don't even realize that we've gotten into a place that's potentially problematic. And then when we're in it, sometimes it's hard to extract ourselves from it. Well, how did we get it in the first place? Because there was someone working on us from the beginning. Like someone asked me in a class the other day that they feel very, very weak. They Meaning they feel like they're burdened by all of this stuff they have to do. And even though they try to do so much, they try to do so much, they feel burdened by what Hashem is asking of them. Should that be a burden? That is the Yetzirah coming to you. That is the evil inclination coming to you. Why? Because the Yetzirah doesn't want you to do certain things, right? So he's going to pat you on the back and say, Oh my God, you're such a tzaddik, you do so much. You're such a tzaddik, right? You're such a tzaddikah. You do so much. You can take a break now. It's time for a little vacation, right? You can relax. This is what makes it more difficult. So from a spiritual point of view, the Yetzirah went on the inside. Physically, they also changed. Like you said, they recognized that they were naked, right? And when they physically changed, another two things happened. Their body changed, right? Because beforehand, Adam and Chava had a body that was not supposed to die, which means it didn't get old, didn't get wrinkles, none of that kind of stuff, right? And very commonly, someone asked me the other day in the Shabbat, they asked me, you know, if I come back during the resurrection, when I have a tichiyat tametim, when I come back, this is a very common question that answer, question women will ask. Men don't ask it so much, but the women always ask, if I come back, how old am I going to be? Right? That's a question you want to know. Why are you asking that question? Come on. Because as one gets older, it's not the same as it was before, Right? They say beauty is wasted on young people, right? When you can finally appreciate what it is, it's your person's getting older, right? Obviously, that's not correct, because beauty is what's on the inside, not what's on the outside, right? But nevertheless, so what's the answer to that? I say like this, I think a person can choose. Maybe they can choose. And what would be the youngest you can come back? What do you think the youngest you can come back is? 20. 20. Why is youngest 20? Why is that the youngest? You're not going to come back 18. How old was Adam? How old was Chava? We know that even though they were one day old on Rosh Hashanah, they were not babies. Everybody knows what a one day old baby looks like. One day old baby can't fend for themselves, can't do anything for themselves, right? Adam and Chava were able to take something from the tree and eat it, right? This is not a baby. Babies don't pick fruit off the tree and eat it, right? So we see that despite the fact that Adam and Chava were one day old, their body was older than one day. And what is the minimum age they could have been? 20. Why is that the minimum age they could have been? Why couldn't they have been 12? She would have been 12, he'd be 13. Why were they both a minimum of 20? Because it says that a court, there's two kinds of courts. One is a court of this world, and one is a court in the world to come, right? A court in God's world, realm, okay? The court of this, of our, of man, man's court punishes at what age? 12 for girls, 13 for boys, right? We learn that from Ben Sorero More, right? What happens to a Ben Sorero More? We read a couple of weeks ago. A ben, he has to be a ben, which means he has to be a young, between 13 and 13 and a half. If he's 13 and a half and older, he can't be a ben sorero more. Why? Because he's not a ben. If he's less than 12, less than 13, he can't be because he's not yet a fit for punishment. So between 13 and 13 and a half, that's when he's called a ben. So we see that a, um, a human court can punish a person once they become bar or bat mitzvah. 
that's one of the things it means. When, a, when you say you become a bar, a bar mitzvah, you are responsible. You're responsible for your actions, both the positive and, of course, the negative, okay? But that's a human court. What about the heavenly court? How old does a person have to be before they are subject to punishment from heavenly court? They have to be at least 20 years old. How do we learn that? We learn that from the Midbar. Who were the ones who were punished that they could not go into the land of Israel? 20 years old and up. What about the 19-year-olds? What about the 18-year-olds? No. Why not? Because the court in Shemaim doesn't have jurisdiction until a person is 20. So Adam and Hava, how were they punished? There was no other people around. They couldn't have been punished by a human court. What court punished them? The court in Shemaim. So therefore, they had to be at least 20 years old. So when a person gets resurrected, one of the simple answers is, you could be 20. And why is that great? Because you'd stay 20. Which means even though you're 21, 22, 23, the bottom line is nothing changes. Aging is a factor of the punishment of Adam and Chava. When a person is not aging, when a person is not going to die, then there's no aging. So now, so we see that there was a physical, there was a spiritual change and a physical change. The body of Adam, the body of Chava changed to the point where now it was going to age, it was going to get older. The tree that they ate from, what's it called? Etzadat tovara. Was there any knowledge the tree gave over? What, Chava became suddenly more wise and so had more wisdom? What does it mean, Etzadat tovara? What does it mean, a tree of knowledge? So the Rabban explains that before Adam and Chava ate from the tree, Everything they did was according to their instinct. Okay? And their natural instinct was to do good. That was their natural instinct. Okay? Which means, Le'ovdal Shomra, Adam Arishon and Chava, well, Adam was commanded, then he told Chava, they had two commandments, Le'ovda, to do the positive things that they needed to do, and to avoid the negative. There's one negative they had to avoid that was eating from the tree. Okay? There needed to be an external source in order to convince Hava to eat from the tree. Alone, she never would have done it. Okay? Adam would not have eaten from the tree if it wasn't for the fact that Hava gave to him to eat from the tree. Right? So we see that their natural instinct was to do what is right, which means they were hardwired and built to do what was appropriate. Just like the stars, just like the Ramban says, just like the, the sun and the moon. The sun and the moon have no emotions when they're doing what they're doing. The sun revolves around the earth, the earth revolves around the sun. This continues on and on. Sun rises and sun sets. Nothing changes, which means there's nothing emotional to that. When Adam and Hava had Cain and Hebel, there was no emotion involved in that whatsoever. It was time to have a child. They got together, they had a child, and now they have a child. So what changed after eating from the tree? What is the Eitz Hadah Tovara? The Ramban says what came inside them was desire. And if you look, look at the language of the Torah. What does the language of the Torah say? When they, spit, when they sinned, what did it say? Vatere ha'isha, and the woman saw that the tree is good to eat from, and that the tree is pleasant to look at at the eyes, with the eyes, and the tree is also desirable to make me more aware. So we see once again, passion, desire. Ta'ava is passion, and the other word is, is desire. This is what was put into Adam and Hava internally when they ate from the tree. Why does a person do what's not right? Passion and desire. Okay? Which means for a temporary moment we forget that Hashem is watching. And we, concerned, we become concerned about ourselves. Right? A person can also have passion 
A person can also have desire. How would a person channel their passion and desire in the right place? Passion and desire for doing the mitzvot. Passion and desire for not speaking Lashon Hara. Passion and desire for helping other people. Right? But here, what the Etz HaDat Tov Vara, so we see Dat, the Ramban is explaining, what does it mean Dat? Passion. That the passion was much, was put inside their bodies. And perhaps then we can say, what does it mean that women have Dat Kala? Right? They're not as passionate to do what's wrong. They may be very passionate to do what's right, but they're not as passionate naturally to do what's wrong. Whereas Adam, perhaps, is more passionate to do what's wrong. And this is what the Ramban is explaining, is what is the problem with Etz Adat? What does that have to do with Rosh Hashanah? What does that have to do with the Aser Yimei Teshuvah? Why does a person sin? Right? So the Talmud says, Nichnas bo ruach shtut. What happens is entered into the person a spirit of stupidity, folly, right? Right? Because why? When a person forgets for one moment about God and thinks about themselves, they're going to take what they think they need at that time. This is the source for sin. This is the source for not following what the Torah is asking of us. To identify this is very, very important. To identify that when the Yetzirah comes to a person, generally it comes through the passion and through the desire. Okay. Now we know that Chava, we could say from here, seems to be responsible for the initial problem. Correct? Even though Adam was not an innocent party, he also ate from the tree, he could have not eaten from the tree. Chava was the instigator. When was this sin initially corrected? In the Torah. Five books of Moses. Where? What about Matan Torah? corrected this sin. And maybe we can get a hint of some of the work we have to do on the holiday. It says, when Bnei Yisrael said, Na'asev Nishma, the Zohar says, Paska Zohamato Shel HaNachash. The, the filth of the Nachash, which was injected into man and woman, was removed. Which means the Yetzahara now became external again. What chased the yet? What was it that corrected the sin? Na'asev and Ishma. What does that mean, Na'asev and Ishma? We will do, and then we will understand. The word Nishma doesn't just mean listen. Lishmo kol shofar, correct. But also, what does it mean lishmo kol shofar? Not just mean to hear it, it's to understand the voice of the shofar. What does a person have to understand about the shofar? I mentioned this in Shabbat. What is a person supposed to understand about the shofar? There's a lot of things. The simple thing, it's a cry. On Rosh Hashanah, a person is not supposed to make themselves cry. The problem is, since the temple was destroyed, all the gates of prayer are closed except the gates of tears. So how are our prayers supposed to be heard on Rosh Hashanah if we're not allowed to cry? Why are we not allowed to cry? Because you're standing in judgment. If you cry, what does that mean? You're guilty. And one thing we know on Rosh Hashanah, nobody says, Chatati, Aviti, Pashati. You don't go before the judge when you go to a court case and you're being tried for, let's say, so you go through a red light, right? 
and you tell the judge, you know, I only go through a red light, I also speed all the time, I sometimes drink when I'm driving, <laughs> that's not going to help you. <laughs> now, God, of course, knows what's going on, but we're supposed to be trying to be, you know, even though we have those 10 days to, you know, which begins on Rosh Hashanah, to fix ourselves, we don't admit our sins on Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is a time for just standing there in awe of God, accepting His authority. What is Naseh and Ishma? Whatever Hashem says, we're going to do. Which means our ratzon, our will, right, is canceled vis-a-vis the will of God. So what does that mean as a Jew? When a person is willing to sacrifice their will, and God gives you free choice, right? You have a choice. You could do what's right, you could do what's wrong. That's from the tree. When a person is willing to sacrifice their will, or more properly, to be mevatel retzono, for the ratzon of Hashem, to cancel his individual or her individual will for the will of Hashem, what does Hashem then do? He will cancel his will for your will. Which means there's a lot of things we ask for in Rosh Hashanah. Right? We have the seder that we do with the, with the different foods so we can have a happy and healthy new year. Ashkenazim take an apple and honey. Svaradim take seven different things. All this whole, because why? We're trying to make simanim for the whole year. Because we know things are decided on Rosh Hashanah. As the Torah says, Mereshit shana ad harit shana. From the beginning of the year until the end of the year. When is the beginning of the year? Rosh Hashanah. Which means what happens at the end of the year is already many ways decided, not what you're going to do, but what you're going to receive, is already decided on Rosh Hashanah. So we want to have a good siman for the year. We want to have things, we want to start things off right. It's sort of like when a husband and wife, they get married. The Torah teaches us, v'simahatishto, he has to make his wife happy for one year. He's not allowed to go out of the town in order to have a job, even if he can make money, unless she gives him permission. Because that first year, they have to spend time with each other. So Rosh Hashanah, we want to make sure that we're doing the right thing, that we're close to Hashem. And if we cancel our will, then what's going to happen? Even if we deserve X, Y, Z, Hashem is going to cancel that because we follow what He wants us to do. So Naseh and Ishma, this is the correction for the sin of Adam HaRishon. And that's why the Zohar says that what happened? The filth of the snake was removed. No more death. Obviously, it didn't last too long. When did it come back? With the spies? Nope. When they were building the golden calf? Correct. Mm-hmm. You say they. <laughs> Who was they? Men. Men. Right. <laughs> so women, they learned their lesson. <laughs> they learned their lesson from eating from the tree. And when they said the Zohar, when, when the, the, the snake, the filth of the snake left, and then the men came to them and said, let us make an egel, <laughs> we don't want any part of this, right? So we see, but unfortunately they were just like Chava ate from the tree. And Adam sort of did as well, but she was the instigator. They were both punished. Later on, when a man sinned at the golden calf, that was included the women as well. So you have 2,440 years where the world was in a bad situation because of the women. And you have another 3,000, my math is not great, but more than 3,500 years where the world's in a bad situation. That's right, exactly. It always is the man's fault, right? You know that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we see from here what? Na seven ishma. What does this mean, na seven ishma? Uh-huh. Correct. Which means your action doesn't depend on your understanding. That doesn't mean you're not going to understand. Otherwise, they would have said, whatever you say, na se. They said, Naseh v'nishma, which means we want to understand. Why do we want to understand? Okay, that's a negative. Let's go for the positive. Why did the Bnei Yisrael say, Naseh v'nishma? 
They could have just said, Naseh, whatever you say, we're going to do. Why is Nishma important? Correct. It makes the action more meaningful when you understand why. So meaning, the understanding of the mitzvot is only to enhance the action of the mitzvot. Understanding of the mitzvot is not a prerequisite for doing them. Doing them that is not negotiable. But the understanding is there so that we can, when we understand, it means more to us, it's more meaningful to us. We're not acting like robots because there's many people sometimes who do things because it's a habit, right? It's a habit. They've been doing it for 10 years like that, they'll do it for the next 10 years like that, right? This is not what Hashem is looking for. Hashem wants to see the investment of the heart. God is looking for the person's heart. And that's why Nishma is so important. Naase, yes, 100%. But you also have to get to the point of Nishma. We will understand. And that removed the destruction. That removed, why? Because they canceled their desire. Because your desire comes before your action, right? You desire something. And then you want it. So if the Torah says you're not allowed to eat pig, and you have a desire to eat pig, you're not going to listen to the Torah. Right? So we see the nishma, when it comes before the na'aseh, is potentially a problem. And that's why when they said the word na'aseh and nishma, the men and the ladies, what happened? The sin of Adam HaRishon was corrected. Why is that important? Because every Rosh Hashanah is an opportunity to fix what was done before. Right? And because we're coming on the same day. The way Jewish holidays work, they are not commemorations of what happened in the past. It's not like you have a July 4th barbecue and you light off fireworks and firecrackers to simulate bombs bursting in air and all that kind of stuff, right? Which means it's a commemoration, right? But barbecue has nothing to do with July 4th, 1776. There was, if we wanted to really relive, relive July 4th, 1776, each one of us should write a, write a Declaration of Independence and sign it. That would be a way that we're reliving what happened. Or at least read the Declaration of Independence. If you're not going to sign it, write it. Read it. But that's not what we do. Jewish holidays are not about commemorating what happened in the past. Jewish holidays are about reliving what happened in the past, which means the spiritual energy that was available to our forefathers originally on that day is once again available to all of us on that day. We can relive what they did, and if we can avoid the mistakes that we made, they made we made in the past, we can fix what was done. So Adam HaRishon, when he was asked by Hashem, Ayeka, where are you? What was his answer? He didn't answer the question, right? What did he say? He said, where are you? Ayeka. What's his answer? I heard your voice. In the garden. And I was afraid because I am naked and I hid. How's that an answer to his question? The first part is, I heard your voice and I listened. No. What does it mean he heard God's voice? If he would have listened to God's voice, he wouldn't have eaten from the tree. Correct? 
I heard your voice. I'm going to drasha. That's not exactly what he means to me. But vayomer et kolacha shamati bagan. I heard your voice. If he would have heard his voice, if he would have heard what Hashem said, if he would have understood what Hashem commanded, he wouldn't be in the situation where he was. He didn't answer God's question. What would have been the answer to God's question? Ayeka. I'm here. That's what God wanted to know, his GPS location yeah, you, on the God, planet. Where are you located spiritually now? So what would be the answer to that question? What should have Adam HaRishon said here? I sinned. Chatati. I made a mistake. This is the entire concept of the Teshuvah. Right? Meaning, God knows we can't be perfect. How does he know that? That is correct. And how did he create us? Imperfect. Imperfectly. He purposely made us like that. It's almost expected that there are going to be times when we fail. But what is a person supposed to do once they recognize that they failed? Teshuvah. Teshuvah. To return. To go back to where you were before. In fact, the power of Teshuvah is you don't return back to where you were before. You return back better than you were before. That's an, almost an anomaly of the Teshuvah, that a person is better off after they sinned and, and made a Teshuvah than before they sinned in the first place. And this is Adam HaRishon. He had an God gave him an opportunity to say, Chatati. Now in Rosh Hashanah, we don't say Chatati. So how can we, how do we, obviously it's the next seven days after that, right? From Shabbat, no, we don't say it on Shabbat either. For the next uh, seven days afterwards, right? How can we correct the sin of Adam HaRishon on Rosh Hashanah without saying Chatati? Isn't it interesting that the major commandment of Rosh Hashanah is to listen to the voice of the Shofar? The mitzvah is not to blow the shofar. Right? The person who's blowing the shofar, what does he say? He doesn't say litkoa b'shofar, to blow in the shofar. He says lishmoa, which means even the person who's blowing, obviously when he's blowing, everybody else is listening. So ideally he should say litkoa, and everybody else would say lishmoa, but that's not it. All of us have an obligation to hear the shofar. Why? Because what happened? We didn't listen when Hashem commanded us the first time. Because we didn't listen, what are we trying to show? That we sin with our ears. And we're trying to fix that. And how are we trying to fix that? By paying attention with our ears to the voice of the shofar. And that's one of the things a person should think about. When you're listening to the shofar, and we call it kol shofar, right? What, what did Adam Marishon say? Et kol shamati bagan. I heard your voice. We're listening to the voice of the shofar. And what is a person internally doing? Saying to themselves, I am going to change. I am going to be better. Even though you don't say it on Rosh Hashanah Chatati Aviti Pashati, you wait until afterwards, the person is listening and willing to take upon themselves what they need to do. Any questions on that so far? What's the next thing Adam Harishon said? Vaira. I was afraid. Right? They're called Yamim Noraim. Is a Jew supposed to be afraid on Rosh Hashanah? Afraid? No. No. A Jew is supposed to be in awe, which is the more proper definition of the word Yirah. In awe of what's going on in awe of the power of Hashem, in awe of the fact that he's the Melech and he's the king. This is what a Jew is supposed to be thinking about. In addition to listening and consciously paying attention, hearing the voice of the shofar, he's, a Jew is also supposed to be thinking to themselves, 
you are the boss. Right? So we have the na'aseh, which is, what does a servant do? Everything the master says. And whether or not the servant understands what the master said, doesn't make a difference. He has to do whatever the master says. But we, when we serve Hashem, He wants us to understand. But He wants the understanding to happen afterwards. So a person has the yirah, the awe of the day, the awe of the awesomeness of Hashem's power, and then he listens to the voice of the shofar. Naaseh, as servants, venishma, and we will listen. Ki erom anochi. Ki erom anochi, that I am naked. How, we, how, we, how, do, how does that? No one goes to shul naked, right? In fact, unless it happens to be mikveh night on Rosh Hashanah, a husband and wife should not be having relations on Rosh Hashanah. Unless it happens to be the night of the mikveh, then of course you can. But if it's not that, that's not why, because then you're losing focus. Right? Your focus is on... Hashem, he focuses on fixing yourself. And this was something that Adam Harishon, what does he say? Ki erom anochi, that he is naked, right? What else? How is a person supposed to feel naked on Rosh Hashanah? Feel, not be. Like when you're ashamed, no? You're stripped of your sins, maybe? Okay, what's it? Shame. Let's go to the shame. A person, well, he was naked before, he wasn't ashamed. Now, because he ate from the tree, he's ashamed. So the shame, I hear what you're saying, but looking for something else. When you're born, you're innocent, you're starting fresh. Okay, good, good, starting fresh. A little deeper than that. When you go on a plane trip, okay, and you have to pass under the, the, the thing, the TSA thing, right? Some people don't like that because it sees right through the clothing, you feel Alien. naked, right? Even though you have all of your clothes on. Because this machine has the power to see through. What do we say on Rosh Hashanah? God is the judge. Why? And he's a fair judge. He's the true judge. He's emet. Why? Because he sees right through you. Meaning, you have that feeling of nakedness. There's no story you can give to embellish on whatever we did wrong. So you feel, and that's good, to feel naked. Meaning, not be naked, but feel naked that Hashem sees right through to what's going on. And that's the judgment a person receives based on the internal mechanism that no one else in the world might know about. But he knows about. Erom anochi And I hid. Does Hashem expect us to hide on Rosh Hashanah? No. As a matter of fact, the concept of the 10 days of repentance is a person who covers up his sin will not be successful. The person who admits and then leaves the sin receives mercy. So we see the concept of hiding. No. You're exposed. You can't hide from God. We laugh at the story of Yonah, that Yonah, when God commanded him to go to the city of Nineveh and tell them they're going to be destroyed, and Yonah didn't want to go, we laugh, because what did he do? He got on a boat and he took a trip. And again, there was some reason he did that, because there's no prophecy on the water. Okay? So he took a trip in a boat, this way Hashem wouldn't speak to him. But... Uh, he's not, he knows what Hashem commanded him. That changed because he went on the water. It's almost a little foolish that you're not trying to run away from God. You can't run away. There's no hiding. So what is expected? 
Yes, Hashem sees right through. Yes, you're standing naked before Hashem. But what you're going to do is whatever needs to be fixed, you're going to fix. And sometimes we have a tendency to focus on all the bad things we do wrong. Right? And I'm not saying there isn't a place for that. But we should spend some time focusing also on the good things that we do. Spend some time focusing on all the charity that we give. Spend some time focusing on all the mitzvot that we are doing. Okay, maybe they're not perfect. But you know what? We're trying. Hashem pays attention to that as well. So even though he's seeing right through, he understands that we are flesh and blood. That we were created imperfect. And therefore, we have an opportunity to make ourselves better. And the most important thing a person can do during the 10 days of repentance is strengthen their relationship to God. This is the real message of the holidays, to get closer to Hashem, to strengthen that relationship. And this will carry you for a while afterwards. And if a person keeps the momentum going, he can carry that all year long until the next Rosh Hashanah. Any questions? Yes. So I don't understand what you mean that you shouldn't be afraid. Of course you're afraid. You're being judged. Like, I'm afraid. Why, why, why shouldn't you be afraid? Okay, I'll give you an example that I gave the children on Shabbat. Huh? No, but aren't you like afraid? Like, you're being judged. Like, what's, the, what's the problem with being afraid? You're guilty? I don't know. You're guilty whether you're afraid or not. What's the problem with being afraid? The word pachad in Hebrew, pachad. Pachad is really fear, trepidation, right? What's the problem with that when a person's afraid? Well, they try to hide instead of rushing, maybe. Or they don't just try to hide, sometimes they back away. Mm. If a person is afraid, fear, what happens? You step back. Fear does not make you engaged. Fear, right? No? Help makes you disengage. If there's a dog and the dog is barking and you're afraid it's going to bite you, you don't go over to the dog and start petting him on his head. You walk in the other direction. So fear, awe is more proper. Awe is amazed at the greatness of Hashem. Right? What do we say? Melech HaKadosh, he's the Melech, he's the king, he's the boss, all year long, but especially on the holidays, we proclaim that he's the boss. The shofar also represents, like when a king comes by, what happens? You blow the shofar. We are recognizing that the king is with us. So even though we sin, the king is with us. He's closer to us between Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippurim than he is all year long. Despite the judgment. So the judgment, you look at this and say to yourself, remember you were in college or in high school and there was a test that you were going to take and you knew the material. You knew it cold. You studied it. You read your notes four or five times. You read the book. You went to all the lectures. You had group, right? You were almost looking forward to the test. Right? And, and it's like, and then the teacher would come in and say, you know what, we're not going to give the test today, we're going to give it next week. You're like, oh man, really? Come on, I want it today. Where would next week stuff? Now, of course, for those kids that didn't prepare properly, okay, next week, good, I got another week to prepare. So it's directly related to the preparation. If you are prepared and you're standing before a true judge and on top of that he's going to give you back the test and ask you to correct the mistakes and it's an open book test and he's going to give you a hundred if you correct the mistakes by Yom Kippur. Not, anyone, not everyone lives to that, you know, so that's why you should be okay. afraid. Okay, okay, yeah. Time just to improve yourself. That's a lot of things. Well, oh, she's saying not everybody lives to that. Okay, so so you know what? If that, if that's your attitude, then why are you waiting for Rosh Hashanah? Don't wait for Rosh Hashanah. That's why it says in Pirkei Avot, Shuv Yom Echad Lifne Motcha. A person should repent the day before he dies. Does anybody know when they're going to die? No. So what does that mean? Every day. Every day you have to repent. Okay, very good.
But remember this. There's a big difference between the 10 days of repentance and the rest of the year. The rest of the year, a lot of the onus is on you. You have to be the one to rekindle the relationship. On the 10 days of repentance, Hashem is already there. He's almost like inviting you to come closer to Him. And that should be fearsome to you. No, we should anticipate it. We should be looking forward to our appointment. Are we so bad? Are we so bad? Okay, yeah, there's things we could do better. No question about it, all of us. Are we so bad? Don't think about it that way. It's, it's not correct. Why do we take a pomegranate? What is the language of the what is the language? Rekim Shibahem Mleim Mitzvot Karimon. What is Rekim? Well, it can't be wreck from mitzvot because if he's full of mitzvot, how is he wreck? What does it mean, Rekim? What does it mean, Rekim? Rek. Someone who's empty. How could it be em- filled with what? If its seeds represent mitzvot, then what's Rek? What's empty? Well, it's full of seeds. How could it be va- empty? If it's full of seeds, it's not empty. It could be more seeds in there, sure. What is Rekim? The Torah teaches us, I think it was last week's parasha, Ki lo davarek hu mikem. Right? Because the Torah is not something that is empty from you. What does it mean from you? Why couldn't it just said Ki lo davarek hu? Right? That would have been enough. Stop the sentence right there. What is the Mikem? Kilo davar rek hu. Stop. Then it says Mikem. What is Mikem? That if there's something that you see that's empty in the Torah, why is it empty? Because you don't understand. You're the one who's empty. You're the one who's rek. You're the one who doesn't understand what the beauty of what's going on. That's why Nasev and Ishma, first you have to do. Just because you don't understand doesn't mean it's not important. It is important. You just don't understand it. So now he understands what is Rekim Shebahem. That they think that the, 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 they don't understand. But they still have Nasev. And those people are full of mitzvot karimon. What about for those of us that are not wreck? What about for those of us that two days before the holiday, despite the fact that there's a lot of preparations that we can be doing, decide to come to a shir of Torah to learn how to prepare in a spiritual way for the holiday? We're, we're, not, we're not empty. We may not be as full as other people, but we're certainly not rekim. And if they're full of mitzvot, how about us? Why are we not focusing on that? I'm not saying don't focus on the the things that we do wrong. Of course a person has to focus. You have to look on Rosh Hashanah to make a determination of what you're going to have to work Teshuvah for. But a person should be nervous. And you're forgetting some other thing. The judge also happens to be a father. Right? Avinu Malkenu. Even though he's the Melech... He's also our father. Right? And your father is not interested. Even if, you, even if you, when you did something wrong as a kid, and maybe your father gave you a little pot, or he gave you a little bit of punishment. Why did he give you the punishment? Because he wanted to be cruel, make you suffer? He wants you to recognize what you did and to fix it. That's Avinu Malkenu. So why are we so afraid? We should be eager, anticipating, looking forward to it. Do you know what an opportunity this is? If you, God forbid, a person commits murder, and he goes before a judge, judge death penalty, there's no way to fix that. Done. A human judge, once you're, once it's, even if it's a Jewish court, a Jewish court, once the sentence is passed, they take him right away to kill him. 
There's no appeals process, no Supreme Court, no death row, none of this nonsense. As basically, they, a person is guilty of a capital right, offense. The witnesses come, they testify. The judges are not allowed to make a determination that day. They have to sleep on it, okay? And then they wake up the next morning after they finish davening and praying, and hopefully they get the right answer. And the judges vote, and if the vote and the vote is the majority vote that the person should is guilty, he's immediately taken to be killed. There's no appeals process. There's no 10 days of repentance. Nothing like that. We're standing for Hashem. Hashem wants us to fix it. How do we know that? Because it says in the Pasuk, God does not want the death of the wicked. He wants them to return. He has no desire for the person to get punished. His desire, it's almost like you have two choices, you have two paths. This path is a very, very easy path. No suffering, no difficulties, no nothing. This is the path that if you go this way, you get, it's going to be a little trouble that way. Right? It's sort of like it's like into a, a, um, a path in the woods. You're going, you're going hiking. Okay? And again, there's no, there's, no, there's no cement over there, but when people walk and walk and walk over a certain path, what happens is that's the path where you go on, right? Anything that's been trampled on before, you know the path. You decide you want to be creative. So what do you do? You veer off the path. Now you're going to uncharted territory. What happens? You're going to get stung. You're going to get... If you go along the path, you're less likely to be damaged. This is exactly what the Torah is looking for, for those to go on the path. That's the concept of misila yisharim, the path of the just. A person should be going on the straight path. Why take a crooked path that's going to take you in the wrong direction? Still afraid? It's like those kids in school, the ones who studied the most, they were the ones most afraid for the test, you know, but they were the ones who got 100 every time. <laughs> So this is what we want to keep in mind for Rosh Hashanah. What else should a person be thinking about when they hear the shofar? So the text talks about crying, right? We mentioned the shofar is representing that we're listening, actively listening, and we're going to actively listen from now on. What else is shofar? Why is it a shofar? Why is it not a trumpet? Ah, Akedat Yitzchak. What is Akedat Yitzchak? Complete faith in Moshe. Okay, we know Avraham had complete faith, but he had to do something else. What was Abraham's character trait par excellence? Chesed. Chesed means giving, loving kindness, showing love to all, strangers. I mean, Sodom. God comes to Abraham and says, Sodom are evil people, very, very evil. I'm going to destroy them. He negotiates with God in order not to destroy Sodom. This is Abraham, right? God comes to him and tells him to sacrifice his son. He's not negotiating. Do you know what kind of strength he had to have to overcome his nature of goodness to be willing to take his son to sacrifice him? Even if he believed in Hashem, it's almost like it's almost like Oscar Madison cleaning up the house. It's almost like a person who's a neat freak living in a messy house or someone who's a messy person living in a neat house. It's, it's against his nature. It's against his grain. And yet what did he do? He overcame his nature to do the will of Hashem. That's called Naaseh Venishma. But we don't call it it's called Akedat Yitzchak. Why is it called Akedat Yitzchak? He went along with it as well. He went, how, long was, how old was Yitzchak? 30. 37. Good luck, any of you having a teenage boy, or for that matter, a teenage girl, saying, you know what, when you go up to the mountain, God commanded me to sacrifice you. Oh, really, Mom? What are you on? <laughs> what drugs are you taking? You can't even get them to do the dishes and take out the garbage, Right? So he's 37 years old, and he knows, we see from the interaction, he knows what's going on, and he's a willing sacrifice. Why do we take the shofar? 
How does it remind us of the Akedah? Correct. Right? And the, how did they, the ram, it specifically says something. Ne'echaz basevach bekarnav. That the ram was, connect, was ne'echaz, which was, was tied up by its horns in the bush. The Torah makes a point of saying that the ram was stuck he couldn't go. He was stuck, which means the horn was stuck in the bush. A rem as to what? That this shofar is going to be how we're going to remind ourselves. We don't have to remind God. It's called Yom HaZikaron, right? Rosh Hashanah is called Yom HaZikaron, the day of remembering, right? God forgets? Who forgets? We forget. So who, who, we're supposed to be reminding ourselves. What are we supposed to be reminding ourselves? Abraham was our father. Isaac was our father. And these people were great. And they expected nothing in return. All they did was did exactly what you asked them to do. Despite all of their trials and tribulations, all the promises that God made to Abraham, he didn't have a place to bury his wife. You're gonna, I'm going to give you the land from the Euphrates River all the way to the Nile. If Abraham was a comedian, he'd say, come on, God, Euphrates to the Nile, at least give me a place to bury my wife. <coughs> no complaints. You just do whatever Hashem said. And this is before the Torah. So what are we reminding ourselves? We're reminding ourselves of our good stock. We're reminding ourselves of our forefathers, the ones who were willing to walk with Hashem with judgment, not just on Rosh Hashanah, all year long. And that's what we're reminding ourselves with the Shofar as well. The willingness of Avraham to sacrifice his son, to overcome his midot, and the willingness at the, the, the level that Isaac was willing to sacrifice himself for something that he himself didn't hear. God didn't come to Isaac and say, by the way, your father's going to take you as a sacrifice, go do it. Isaac was willing to sacrifice himself just based on his father's word. Naseh venishma. Once again. And that's another thing the shofar is representing. Any questions? Okay. I'm going to stop here because I guess you guys have a lot of preparations. We also want to do Hatarat Nedarim if that's okay. Baruch Adonai, Lama, Amen, Amen.